What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Reseller Greatness Podcast. And we have my main man, Jack, on the line for us. And this is going to be a little bit different. Jack is very Amazon-centric. However, out of everybody that has been in the group, even though he does Amazon, he does a little bit of eBay. Sometimes we could get Jack out of the cave and do a little bit of eBay. But um, out of everybody in the group, I think that our two business models are the most similar. And I think that I have learned the most kind of nuggets from you about how you operate your business, how you run your business, even though it is a different kind of business with a different kind of widget. Um, so eBay sellers don't tune out. I have learned a ton from Jack just by listening to him talk about Amazon, talk about his money management, you know, his margins, his outlook on, you know, flipping his money. Because to me, that's the name of the game, Jack. We got to put these items up. We got to sell them. We got to keep a little bit for ourselves. And we got to go out and buy more. Essentially, that that's the name of the game. We can end the podcast right now, Jack. That's the <laughs> end of that, that. That's the name of the game. So, without further ado, Jack, go ahead, give us a little bit of an introduction. Let us know, I guess, where you came from, what you do, where you are now, and kind of what business you run. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, uh, right now, my business is almost entirely video games and almost entirely on Amazon. I do do some eBay as well. It's mostly higher end collectibles. I think my ASP on eBay is really high, like 150, because it's mostly high end stuff and it's stuff that I'm kind of more passionate about, like cards. But my main business is on Amazon. Uh, my uh, ASP on Amazon is about $23. Uh, my cost of goods is usually about 4 to $5. Uh, it's very similar to the model that uh, you run with your eBay store, yeah. where the stuff all gets delivered to me. I've been doing Amazon uh, full-time since about 2017. I got started going to thrift stores, uh, like buying uh, mostly books, uh, scanning stuff with barcodes, flipping puzzles, uh, sealed games, DVDs, whatever I could really get from thrift stores. Uh, thrift stores are very hard to get video games from, though. Uh, but I did the uh, grinding on the thrift route uh, for like about three years or so, and it got me a ton of capital. And then I was able to turn that capital and buy like video games to be able to buy large uh, amounts of them and have them all shipped to me. And at this point, I really don't go to thrift stores anymore or garage house unless it's for fun. Uh, but I really enjoyed kind of the time on that route with it. And basically, at this point, my business is just mostly uh, video games on Amazon, a lot of bulk video games, um, just trying to like turn over as much, sell as much as possible. And I think the last uh, three years or so, I've sold about uh, over a million each year on Amazon as well. Absolutely. So I wanted to put that out there because we're not talking to a <laughs> chump here. This is a guy who three years in a row have sold over a million dollars sourcing online, working mm -hmm. from home packaging yeah. stuff up, sending it out. So what does a typical day look like for a guy who does a million dollars in sales, sourcing the way you do? What What's what, what's the full day for, for Jack? Yeah, sure. So uh, I really like having the freedom of working from home. Like I don't, I didn't want to have a warehouse. I didn't want to have a lot of employees. Um, so like I, I really enjoy just being able to kind of be more casual with my schedule. I usually wake up around about 8.30 or 9 or so. Um, sometimes I get on uh, like a mastermind call or talk to some people on Discord. Uh, but I'm usually kind of uh, starting up and listing uh, pretty early with that. I list probably on average about four hours per day. I end up usually mm -hmm. listing about 200 video games in a day. And the reason why I can do that is because Amazon's very efficient at uh, being able to do it if it's you're just a solo operation because I don't have to ship out. Like I can just focus on listing as much inventory as possible. So that's about like the the averages for me is about uh, I can do about 200 in about four hours. Uh, it's about a video game a minute or so basically for that. And as far as like the rest of the day, I spend some time sourcing. Um, I, uh, I have a... Um, I do a little bit of side stuff with eBay as well. So um, that's about the schedule for me. It's mostly kind of the freedom of being able to like do how I went with it. That I really love the most with it. Absolutely. So people here, four hours, you could bust out 200 games. So mm -hmm. you do Amazon FBA, which means fulfilled by Amazon. So they have their photos already set up. They have the listing already made. Um, you put everything into a box. You send it out to Amazon. 
And then Amazon has it on their marketplace. When they sell it, you get paid. Amazon fulfills the order. They handle the customer service. They send it out to the customer. So when we are buying stuff on Amazon, a lot of times that's coming from people like Jack. A lot of people think when you shop on Amazon, it comes from Amazon. But they have a whole army of people out there sourcing and they do what's called Amazon FBA. So that's why Jack can leverage all of those things that Amazon makes possible. And that's why he's able to do 200 in, in four hours. So essentially, when you are assessing these deals, maybe sometimes you buy a collection, maybe you know, you're buying one-offs from wherever you buy them from. You already have the Rolodex where you can piece it out, where you could price it out. You already know what these items are going to sell for. They arrive to you. You might have to do a little bit of refurbishing. You might have to do a couple of repairs. Of course, we want to keep that as a minimum if we want to keep the profits high and we want to keep this hourly 204 hours high. And are you doing a lot of scanning with, with, with a barcode reader to build your shipment, to send them in boxes? How does... How does the workflow for Amazon go? I used to sell on Amazon, but I've been out of the Amazon game for a minute. Yeah, sure. So uh, a lot of the stuff I might uh, get will need some repairs or uh, might have a damaged case that can be swapped out. I think you can see behind me, I have like cases on shelves uh, as well. I I have a, um, a professional refurbishing machine to um, like refurbish discs. Um, that's one of the kind of advantages you can do if you're doing like a bulk model. You can buy stuff cheaper that might need some like extra work with it and then put in a little bit of time to it and be able to uh, get like a higher margin out of it uh, by just kind of like taking a little bit of time with it. That's one of the really big advantages of doing used items is you can, they're usually much higher profit margin because it takes a little bit longer to do it. And it's kind of just all about kind of refi refining the process of it. And as far as like my process goes, I try to be as efficient as possible because I'm going to make more money if I'm more efficient, like I'm really like passionate about like the dollar per hour that I'm generating. Uh, so there's only so many hours in the day. So I look at what's my profit per hour, basically of the time that I'm spending doing something. So I really want to make sure I'm focusing on like the highest profit tasks. And that's kind of how, why I do what I do now is because I've done a lot of different models, but uh, this model for me is like, like the highest like profit per hour, basically of the like it leverages my time kind of the best with it and basically for what it looks like when i list i have some listing software uh, i use um mostly for amazon I use inventory lab there's a lot of other uh software you can use it makes you more efficient uh but i'm just trying to be like being able to list as quickly as possible basically because my my games have i know you talk a lot about sell-through rate um i know that 99 percent of the games i send in are going to sell and I'm pricing it basically for a 1% sell-through rate. So uh, I'm looking at kind of turning over my inventory every about 90 to 100 days or so uh, on that. So basically, um, like I price looking at like a 1% sell-through. And I know that every game that I'm going to send in is going to sell basically. Um, unless there's some kind of like weird uh, crash or change in the market. So like 99% plus of stuff is actually going to sell. All right. So guys... If you have been watching the podcast, you know, I sit over here and I take notes every now and then I write down some stuff because I don't want to forget it. When Jack talks, I already have 12 talking points that, that I want to revisit. So when Jack talks, we might have to rewind it. We might have to go back one minute. He's just going to spit a fact a minute and we just got to keep up with Jack. So I have a lot. I have a lot over here on my sheet. All right. All right. Dollar per hour. Yeah. You say you want to list 200 games in four hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it took you eight hours to list the 200 games, what happens? Well, I like I do care a lot about kind of my lifestyle and other stuff. And so like I, I want to spend time like I have spent like, you know, 12 hours per day, like listing. There was a day on a few days ago where I listed a thousand video games in a day. So it is possible to like spend all day listing. Right. But Jack. Yeah. If you listed the same 200 games in four hours, you listed mm -hmm. the same 200 games in eight hours. Oh. What happens? Well, the profit per hour would go down, basically. Profit uh, and, per hour yep. goes down. So when you said mm -hmm. you did a 12-hour shift, you mm -hmm. sent out 12 hours worth of video games. Yep. And I think a lot of resellers, we get caught in that trap where we spend 12 hours doing work, but we have mm -hmm. two hours of results to show for the work. Yeah. So how do you... 
sit down in your chair, lock in for four hours, and try to be as productive as possible for the next four hours, being cognizant that you are trying to work towards a certain hourly rate. Yeah, it, it, that's definitely something I've struggled with as well. Like, I, I think it's very hard for like, you're incredible at that being able to focus in on stuff. Um, it like I do feel that a lot of resellers get distracted by things like Facebook or notification popping of their phone or taking a sure. break for something. So I think a lot of times the work that they're spending listing is broken up by you take a photo, you list something, then you take a break for five minutes. Um, so you really have to be like locked in on the time if you want it to be best. Like some of the uh, like I've definitely struggled this is with this as well. Uh, some of the things that's helped me is I set a timer sometimes to time myself to make sure. Uh, so I have sometimes a timer running. So I'm trying to beat my time on doing a shipment, trying to be as efficient as possible during that time period as well. Uh, but I'm not perfect on that kind of stuff as well with it. So like sometimes um, it, it does take me longer to actually do stuff with it, but I just need to make sure I'm not, I'm actually getting the work done in the day. Yeah. And actually like getting uh, what I want my goals hit basically with it. Right. So we have to be cognizant. We have to be paying attention to that because the time is finite. And mm -hmm. if we are going to spend four hours, we need to have four hours worth of results. We, we can't yep. take a four hour job and drag it out to 12 hours because, you know, if, if you give someone 12 hours to do a four hour job, they'll make it take 12 hours. But yep. since we are our own bosses, we have to be the ones to say, hey, I have 12 hours today. This can't take 12 hours. We got to get it done in the time frame that this is supposed to take. So I, I, I want to touch on something else. So since you are doing 200 games in a day, call, call it a day, wh whatever it is, 200 games in a day. Um, I saw a post from you yesterday, which was really enlightening, where you were showing, you were showing your graph and talking a little bit about um, your model. And in the back of, of one of the pictures, you had some games that were low value. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and someone was asking, are you going to send those in? And you said, yes, because you have a metric where if you make one or two dollars, you're good with that. So yeah. e explain the reasoning behind that. And, and what you said, hopefully you get there, but, but what you said made a lot of sense to me. So you're buying the collections. That's where we start. Inside of a collection, you have the good, the mediocre, the not so good. Yeah, this is a great uh, question. It was brought up in uh, the Facebook thread. I think the uh, person's question was he saw some games that were lower value on my shelves. I just took a picture of my shelf and I think he made like one game was like Just Dance 4 and he was saying that that game sells for $9 on that. Why would you list that basically if you're paying $4 for it? Yeah. And the reason why is because the numbers I gave at the start of the podcast average the average my average cost of goods is about four to five dollars. My average selling price is twenty three. Those are the averages. So I will I will list something if it makes sense to list it, basically. So like there's gonna be some games that sell for sixty, seventy bucks, and there's gonna be some games that sell for like ten dollars. And it's still worth it for me to list the ten dollar video games because like my model, like I'm buying bulk lots of stuff. So I'm getting I'm, there might be an amazing game, $80 game, along with 19 other games that are 10 to $15. So it's worth it. Like, even though like I'm making money on the $80 game, I'm still going to list the $10 games because that's part of like the lot that I, that I purchased. And the the cutoff though, is that it has to be efficient to, to actually list it. So there are some games that are not worth listing. Like we fit might be one of them. Like it's a $6 video game after fees you're making almost nothing on that. Uh, so what I usually do, my cutoff is I'm looking at about, uh, you, you don't figure in cost of goods on this. You figure just in after all of your fees, but I'm looking at about two to $3 profit. So like I said, I can list a video game in about a minute or so. So sometimes that's even faster if the game is in perfect condition. So a game might be in perfect condition, doesn't need any work. It takes 30 seconds. So I just pick it up, like list it immediately. Sometimes it's, it might be a $8 game that needs some resurfacing, not worth listing because it takes extra time to do that, throw that away basically. So I'm looking at like how quickly it takes me to list it. So the reason why I might list a $9 game is my profit on that, not taking into account cost of goods is like about three bucks after everything, shipping fees, all that. Um, and it takes me maybe 30 seconds to a minute to list it. So if it takes me a minute to list it and $3 profit, 
then that's $180 per hour like profit from like, so it's definitely worth it to actually list that item. So you kind of have to take that in mind is how long does it take you to process the stuff? Like I, I don't do too many consoles because it takes so much longer to test those. It might take like 15 to 30 minutes to test that. And that profit per hour of testing a console, like say I buy a Wii for $60, I need to spend the time testing it basically. And maybe I sell it for like a hundred or so. And but that took me like 30 minutes to test it. So my profit on that might only be about 30 bucks or so. And I'm making $60 per hour on that Wii um, where I could just like list video games in a minute. That's $3 profit and make $180 profit per hour basically on that. So I'm, like I'm always looking at how long does it take me to actually do this and comparing like what is the most efficient for me to actually list in the time I have to do with it. Absolutely. And something else that you said inside of that thread was that when you are buying a collection or buying a bulk deal, you allocate X dollars for the good games and mm -hmm. you allocate X dollars for the for the not so good games. So even though your average cost of goods is four dollars for the $80 game, you might have allocated seven dollars mm -hmm. for the game that's going to sell for 10. You might have allocated one dollar. Yeah. And that's still two games for eight dollars, which brings us back to our average cost of goods of, of four. Yep. Yeah. And that's how you kind of like value lots is that you're taking all the stuff in it and kind of like you assign a value to it based on how much you'd be willing to pay. Like uh, like like Wii Party for the Wii is a game that sells for like uh, sixty eighty dollars. So I usually value that about and when my in my head, basically in my cost of goods, I value that maybe out twenty to twenty five dollars in a lot. So basically that's how you kind of value like a lot if you're buying it basically is you're trying to assign like an amount you would normally pay uh, for different games and a lot. So um, that's how I work it with my cost of goods basically. Absolutely. And, and how many items, I mean, there, there's not an exact number, but when you are ass assessing a collection, some of those items are assessed zero. Yeah. Because yeah, it, there's a certain amount of items that's going to recapture all of your money and, and, yeah. and still turn you a profit. Yeah, I think that 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 uh, picture I showed on my shelf, uh, there's probably a lot of games on there I wouldn't send in. Like I on my desk here, I have a ton of games that like are just not worth sending in. Sometimes they're worth it, but like Hannah Montana for the Wii, uh, not really worth sending in. That's about six to seven dollar game. Uh, so like I have like I if it's not really worth the time to process it, then I'm gonna just like throw it out. Sometimes I take the case and reuse it for other stuff, like case here. Um, and just part it out quickly. Uh, so like not everything that I get in lots is worth the time to send in. So I make kind of make a, like I, I've done this so long that I can usually know what games are worth sending in just by looking at it. Uh, but back in the day, I just scanned the barcode and see like how much it's selling for and kind of make a quick decision on whether to like send it in or not. Absolutely. So in order to be able to process and send in items where maybe, and this is not the bulk of your business, but it is part of the business where in order to process and send in items where maybe you're going to make two, three or four dollars profit, we have to be super duper efficient and we have to have yeah. these high amounts of we, we need to be able to process high amount of widgets per hour. Yeah. If we want to be able to have a business, sustain a business around a portion of it being a smaller margin, because if you were sending in all Mario parties and you're going to make thirty dollars profit yeah. on them. You could be as slow as you want to be and you can send in five an hour and you'll still have a beautiful business. But with this, until they could back up the truck of all Mario parties in Jack's front lawn, that is not a reality. So we have to be able to build a business around being able to process a lot of items in a given time because a good amount of these items aren't going to be the Mario party large profit. So in order for, yep. in order for this to work where we are sending in items that have a smaller margin, we have to be able to process a lot of widgets. Yeah, that's a really great point on that. Um, like, I think that some people get like hung up on the fact that they have to sell like above a certain amount, but it all comes down to how fast you can process it. Uh, there, like, there's a lot of card sellers out there who can probably process like 200 cards an hour. Like, and there's even like there's AI programs that can let them list like super super fast, so they can right. they can deal with a smaller profit per item because they're listing so fast. It it really comes down to like how fast can you actually list your inventory and being as efficient as possible with it. That exactly. Yep. So when when we talk about being efficient, what type of things are you looking? I'm gonna name a couple. Hopefully, I don't steal your thunder. The efficiency the efficiency that I like to look at 
is defects because okay. defects are going to cause returns. Returns cost money. They cost time and customer service. Maybe you get a bad feedback. You have to send a couple messages. You have to send a label. It's an unhappy customer. So for efficiency, as you know, I've said it a million times, I want to go perfect first and then speed later. So mm -hmm. when you set up your, your process as when we are speaking of efficiency, I guess, what are some things that you're looking for for efficiency? And what are some things where you say, all right, I'm going too fast at the sake of now I'm kind of working backwards because I can I could do 200 items in an hour. It's mm -hmm. one photo and it's a crap listing. Yeah. But wh where is that going to get me? You know, so so there is a tipping point where we, we hear these numbers of 200 in, in a four hour shift, which which is great. But you have assessed the tipping point where I'm going too fast and now it's going to cost me money. So I guess in efficiencies and 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 I think that's something that, that you are very good at. And that's something that you and I that we kind of always related on is trying to build a very efficient process. Just kind of, I guess, stepping back. What do you look at and kind of what are the efficiencies that you measure? And I guess when do you know to kind of tap the brakes? Yeah. So I um like Amazon is all like very much the customer. Um, uh, the, I really want to provide a really good experience for the customer. So I always want to make sure the game is in really good condition when they get it. So I want to make sure it's working for them. I want to make sure the case is in good condition. Um, so I'm like, I, over the years, I've gotten really good at like being able to quickly change out cases, fix stuff, like identify if the disc needs to be resurfaced. And I'm making that decision uh, based on like the value of the game, like a game like Mario Kart 8, th this case is actually damaged a little bit. So I put it right. aside because I have to replace it. Um, so that game is worth doing because that's probably about $25 or $30 game uh, right there. But if it's um, if it's a random like Hannah Montana game like I showed here and it needs a new case, that's a six or seven dollar game. It's not worth the time to actually like like replace the case on that. So I'm really looking at the the dollar that Mountain is going to sell for and whether it's worth the time to actually uh, do that. So if a game is scratched up, it's like dirty and it's like a like eight dollar game, I'm just going to pretty much like put that aside and not send that in. And but if it's like a twenty five dollar game, I'll recase it, resurface it, all that kind of stuff, because it'll only take me about two to three minutes to do that. But for an eight dollar game, it's not even not even worth like the two to three minutes because you're only making like two dollars profit on it. So gotcha. So you're looking at the efficiency. Is it on a, an, a, an item by item basis on how much you're going to put into this item? Yeah, it like it's just how much time will it take to gotcha. get to like you, you really want to like give a good experience to customers, especially on Amazon. Uh, Amazon customers are, are pretty picky um, with uh, the quality of stuff they're buying. I really want to make sure that they have a really good experience uh, like getting stuff from me. So like I don't want to send like a dirty case or a crack case sure. or something wrong with it. So and it all comes down to. Uh, the value of the item, whether it's worth it or not, uh, a twenty-five dollar game, it might be worth it to spend three minutes uh, to like clean it up, make it look nice, all that. But like an eight dollar game, uh, like I'm just not gonna send that in if it needs like you know three or four minutes of work basically on it because that's just killing the uh, the profit per hour on that. So absolutely. So mm -hmm. when we are, like you say, you know, figuring out where we need to focus our attention, um, you guys. Amazon sellers, I think you guys have a huge advantage because you guys have that that number, yeah, where it tells you how quickly this item is going to sell. So, oh, yeah, when you are sending in the low profit games, mm -hmm. those might be games that sell this quickly, and essentially yeah. that that's that it's free money at that point. Yeah, to to just slap a sticker on this thing because it's going to sell yep. that quickly. On eBay, we don't have that. On eBay. You can make the best listing and do the best job, and it might sell in 90 days. Where on Amazon, they have one catalog, one listing, and as long as you can get that buy box, that's going to sell. And, and you can calculate it. Okay, this sales rank will sell in four days. This sales yep. rank will sell in 40 days. This sales rank will sell immediately as soon as I pop it onto Amazon. And there were times when, when I was sourcing, and I'm aging myself a little bit here, Jack. You might remember this. You remember Pie Face? Oh yeah, I saw that was that like a lot. what 2014. 
Uh, yeah, I even sold it like later than that too. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> there were times where Pie Face, it was a board game where yeah. you would put whipped cream on it and everyone would take their turn. They would hit a crank and one of the cranks you get smacked in the face with the pie. There were times where I was buying Pie Face from Target yeah. <laughs> and it was selling before I even got to yep. the cash register. Yep. <laughs> so the power of the sales rank or the sell through yeah. on Amazon is much more predictable where I think we can feel better about sending in these games that are getting less less value or less profit because I'm sure you also look at the sales rank and let's say that Hannah Montana was going to get you $2 profit. But mm -hmm. if the sales rank was eight months, maybe yeah. you don't send it in so much if the sales rank was eight days. And and that you really have that advantage when it comes to Amazon and, and the catalog. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that for a moment. Um, yep. Like everything I send in, I know is going to sell unless something really weird happens with it. Um, yeah. So I like that, like a seven or $8 game, I'm pretty sure is going to sell within probably about 90 to hundred days or so, because that's how I price. Uh, I price for like a 1% sell through basically. Uh, so like, I know everything that I'm sending in is going to sell on eBay. So it, it's difficult with eBay. Um, like there are things like video games or if you listed a video game on there and you're priced correctly, it's going to sell like it's it will sell. Uh, it, sometimes it's more difficult, I think, with items that are harder to find a market for. And one of the things with my eBay store is that I'm listing stuff that I think has a demand for it and will sell eventually. It just has to get to a price that the buyer is willing to pay. Um so I did do eBay for a while. I still have a small eBay store and everything listed in there is more higher value. And my strategy on eBay generally is to uh, just kind of reduce the price over time. Like once the, like once every couple of weeks uh, when I was doing it seriously, I'd reduce the price of everything in my store by 10%. That might not be the best practice, but that's kind of how I made sure like inventory was moving through it. And I, I kind of feel like as long as your item has actual demand, which every item you list should have actual demand from a customer, if the price is correct on it, then the customer is going to end up buying it. And it's usually, in my in my opinion, like the stuff I list is mostly that the price is the issue and it has to get to a price the customer is basically willing to pay uh, for it. Absolutely. All right. So we're, we're buying the collections. Not every single item that comes through is salvageable worth sending in. Mm-hmm. Have you found a way to monetize the duds? What are you doing with the duds? Are you using them for coasters around the house? Do you just have drinks sitting on every single CD? I, so, I, I know th this has been a struggle, <laughs> and I think it's a struggle for a lot of people that that do your line of business. So today, like, what is the best way that you have found out to monetize the duds? So unfortunately, I don't have a great strategy for monetizing the duds, and I never really have. Uh, so I talk a lot about, you know, profit per hour on that. And for me, the most like efficient thing is just to get more inventory in and keep listing new inventory. And I do save the duds. I save them in such a way that they don't take up a ton of space. Um, like I usually get rid of the cases, uh, the art, the manual, and just save the discs. That's why I have a pile of discs sitting next to me um, that are not worth listing. Uh, ideally, what you would do probably is make bulk lots of them on eBay uh, bulk them out uh, like that. I like. I would like to uh, do some more eBay, like do my store more. I probably will make a few bulk lots like that eventually. Right now, unfortunately, I just have a like a lot of uh, bulk inventory that I just keep around uh, for now. And the main reason has just been because it's just more efficient to list better inventory than it is to kind of deal with the duds. So, like, I try to keep the duds to a minimum, like space wise, uh, and. Uh, eventually try to find a way to kind of move them efficiently. All or right. maybe I'll just throw them out at some point. <laughs> so, so what is the most efficient way? Because on your call, for people that don't know, you host the Amazon call, the video game call on Friday, and they were talking about that now eBay has available the standard envelope for, for video games or for disc only in those kind of categories, mm -hmm. which, which the standard envelope, I think it's like 30 cents or something like that. It could be off. I've never used it, but I am familiar with it. That standard envelope was for baseball cards, postcards, where it will satisfy eBay tracking, where you still get credit for you, you, you wouldn't lose, you know, top rated or anything. Um, so now that is unlocked on eBay for these low value disc only games. 
So for you, I guess there's two strategies. Is it create a listing one by one disc only, use standard envelope, or is it just put a hundred disc and photograph the hundred disc, throw them in a medium flat rate and send them up the road? Well, for me, it would definitely be a hundred discs, medium flat rate, like bulk. Uh, but I do think that that's kind of cool how uh, eBay like has a standard envelope now available to disc only. Like I didn't know that until like uh, someone uh, reached out to me and told me that it was now like live for disc only. So that's going to like help help a lot for the the cheaper stuff. I probably won't do it since Amazon's my way main uh, like source uh, for that. But I think that's a really interesting uh, model for the future for media is just selling disc only standard envelope because I think the cost was like 88 cents or something like that to do okay. a standard envelope. And compared to a ground advantage, it's like four bucks. So like maybe someone's willing to, to buy Hannah Montana for the Wii for $2 or $3 and you make a small profit on it if you're really efficient with the process for it. But there's no way they'd be like willing to pay like six, seven bucks for it. So I guess if somebody wanted to, and I don't even know if, if it's, if someone is doing this now, they might not. And whoever's listening, you could be first to market with this idea is you could have an eBay store you could build out the entire catalog of disc only. You could build out the entire catalog of, of standard envelope. And every single time one sells, all you had to do is create the listing once and you go back in there and edit the quantity. And, and that way you're not listing items. You have your Hannah Montana disc, yeah. you create the listing, you sell one, you enter quantity, and now you have exposure to the entire catalog. And then yeah. you could just be the, the, the king or queen of standard envelope disc only for cheap. No listing ever again, because we're just going to do multi-quantity out of stock option and just revise quantities. Yeah, there. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff to like figure out with that. It's kind of a new feature in the disc only category. Like, I don't know, like there might be some issues with the post office, like going through a machine and eating up the discs as well. But it's really interesting, like the idea of that. That was like, I just learned about that last week. So like the idea of like creating... I've heard this a lot from other video game sellers is they will create one listing on eBay and kind of own that listing basically uh, and just replenish to that listing. So uh, that might be something in the future as well. And for the eBay sellers, I've seen the most successful in the video game category. They're doing stuff like listing a Nintendo DS console, uh, taking one photo and then replenishing to that listing yeah. basically as well. So that's a very uh, like like a viable strategy for eBay for video games. Yeah, and those listings for eBay, which this is different on Amazon, those listings on eBay where they have a sales history and they do have velocity of sales, that's why when you search something on eBay, those listings are always at the top. So yep. if, if you have a, a Nintendo DS and you've sold 15 of them and you have one more in stock or two more in stock, that listing is going to be right at the top because eBay knows that listing gets clicks, it converts, people buy it, they're happy, you're doing a good job. You know, they you get a positive feedback. It's not opening up a return or an item not as described. They know you got that thing up there. You're going to deliver. It converts when people click on it. And those multi-quantity listings, that's why those are always at the top because they do have the velocity. They do have um, the track history. All right, so to change gears a little bit, I have met you two times in person, which mm -hmm. you hold the record right now. Really? <laughs> I have met you twice. So you used to live in Virginia. You've moved yeah. to Florida. Mm -hmm. And when you first came down, we met up in Orlando. We, we we had we had dinner. And then we recently met up about two or three weeks ago. We had dinner then with some other large Amazon sellers. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, the largest. And, mm -hmm. you know, he jumps on the calls. He, he shares his knowledge. Very, very, you know, very great person. Um, very great advice. And I think you get a lot out of those interactions. You get a lot out of networking with other sellers. You get a lot out of talking to other sellers. And I think that those people, they get a lot out of talking to you. Because right after that dinner, you received a, te a text asking, is this fee increase for real? And at that time, <laughs> you didn't know if they were trolling or not. But that's how we find stuff out. That's how we found out that the standard envelope was available for video games. That's mm -hmm. how we find out when there's changes to the platform. That's how we find out all these different things by creating that network that we can reach out to, whether it's on Discord like you do, whether it's a group, whether it's social media, whether it's a video. The, the, the network of people that we are able to talk to, exchange information. Hey, 
how many times have, have you spoke to the guys that we went to dinner for? And they're telling you exactly what's working for them. And then yeah. you go and you do it. So I guess how has that impacted your business? Because you like to go to a lot of the conventions and stuff. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never been to any. I'm still kind of getting out of my lone wolf phase. But like, I think for you, I, I think that that is one of the things that has helped your business the most from what I gather talking to you as much as we do. Yeah. Um, so around 2018 or so, I started posting to Instagram. Um, uh, my handle on there is video game sourcing. And uh, I uh, it like the account really did well uh, for me. And um, uh, it I met a lot of people through that network with a lot of people uh, on there online at first and met them in real life at different conventions. And a lot of people have shared information with me and I share information with them. And it's like taught me a lot about like business and Amazon and strategies that I can use with it. Like a lot of I do with my current model uh, has been like talking to other sellers, getting ideas from them. Uh, like I try to be as knowledgeable as possible about the platforms I'm on and try to like talk to a lot of people. And I'm in a ton of discords and trying to gather information. I'm also trying to provide value to other people uh, and help them out. And I definitely receive like really good information in return from them. Uh, like, from Instagram, it was really nice being kind of included into groups um, and getting knowledge on stuff as well. So that was super helpful to me. Like I like that was the main advantage I got uh, from doing uh, like sharing a little bit on Instagram um, and doing a little bit of YouTube stuff is uh, a lot of people have come to me with uh, with information and I provide information to them and I learned a lot about my business and like being more efficient with it. So like, I really think that's like really incredible to be able to kind of like uh, network with people. I think like groups like yours is really good for meeting people as well. Um, like you can meet people that are kind of have similar ideas. You can jump on like your Zoom calls, uh, be in Zoom meeting rooms, talk to people. Um, and be able to network with people that are kind of like similar to the stuff you sell and then kind of like talk to them and figure out like what's working for them. I'm in some mastermind groups as well, like small group chats as well, where we kind of talk and like share stuff that's working for us as well. So like that kind of networking is like super powerful, like keeping up to date on all the changes and what works best. Yeah. And if you want to talk about changes, go right over to the Amazon machine. eBay, at least... At least eBay <laughs> will give you a heads up. Hey, <laughs> in six months, we're thinking about doing yeah. this. We're thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jack, I, I, I've lost count of how many times <laughs> you've jumped on a call and you said, okay, emergency <laughs> call, state of state of the union. Amazon just released this last night at three o'clock <laughs> in the morning and the game has changed. So talk about that difference a little bit where eBay, they'll say, hey, they'll tap you on the shoulder and they'll say, hey. <laughs> We're thinking about doing this in six months where Amazon, as you referred to it, they just do the rug pull from time to time. If you remember what, two years ago, they were saying, hey, we're building all these warehouses, send it in, send it in. And then they hit you with the rug pull and raise the fees, yeah. right? Yeah, well, at least uh, recently, the two major changes they put in, had they given us a lot of time uh, for that. They made, they're made they making one change in about a month and one change just uh, came on uh, a few days ago. Uh and the, the major change was they're uh, charging a fee for each item you send in. So I had to kind of reevaluate the the cheaper games I was sending in um, due to that. And also the fee coming up soon is a low inventory fee, which is a fee if you don't have enough inventory in stock. And as far as like the changes, the emergency changes on Amazon, there have been many times in the past where the worst was a couple of years ago where they were doing restock limits. And there were times where I couldn't send in any inventory for two or three months because right. they they rug pulled my inventory limit. So at one point I had something like 22,000 games in stock and they cut me down to about 15,000 and they kept cutting and cutting and cutting. I couldn't send in for about two or three months. And they basically provided no guidance on this, no information. We had, kind of had to figure it out ourselves and talk to among ourselves, share numbers and try to try to figure out how the system actually worked. Um, so right. that is one of the downsides of Amazon is they are, they will do changes very quickly uh, to the platform. And um, so it is, there, there definitely is viable to kind of have a, like a diversity of platforms that you're doing with dealing with. I probably will be doing a lot more eBay in the future, listing some of my other stuff uh, as well. Uh, I don't do too much of it right now. Right now, probably like 97% of my revenue is uh, Amazon. 
Uh, but like having some diversity is probably a really good idea for when they uh, randomly do a change like that overnight. <laughs> So I kind of forgot about that. Okay, so we were in this point coming after the shutdown where Amazon was rocking and rolling. They they were hitting records and all all you guys were hitting records with the sales and sending in a bunch of stuff. And then overnight, they said that they were doing limits on the inventory and they had some sort of formula or calculation. Do you remember what the acronym was? It was like DCR Yeah. or something like that. There's a lot of stuff. There's IPI, there's There it a is. recycle in it. There Yeah. it was crazy. So overnight, they instituted these IPI or restock limits where they said, okay, Jack, based on what you do in your velocity, you're allowed X number of units in the warehouses, right? Mm hmm Yep. Okay. Where the day before, send us everything. Yep. We're ready. So Yep. how, because that, that was big discussion on, on the Amazon calls for months. Yep. where you guys were trying to either take calculated break-evens or small losses to raise your, your IPI or only send in your best stuff so that way you can raise your IPI. So if you raise your IPI, they would allow you more units into the warehouse. So I guess how did all of you guys, I guess, navigate that, work through that? Because... That probably crippled a lot of businesses out there, and there were probably some that their model was very large stores, very low sell-through, very low profit margin. That was a really hard time for booksellers and slower item sellers. Um, for video games, it wasn't quite as bad, uh, luckily. Uh, but I got caught up in it because I was trying to price too high. Mm. I was trying to uh, make... Uh, I was basically targeting a 0.5% to 0.6% sell-through. Uh, and Amazon was looking for a much higher, like 1% to 2% sell-through rate uh, at that time. Uh, so to to get over that, I really had to lower my prices quite a bit. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of caused a an issue where a lot of sellers dropped prices and like at that time because they're all like hit by this issue like right away where they were out of stock and they had to just move inventory, like fire sale it out. Uh, so it was like a tough time uh, with that. But uh, one of the things that, that uh, it is good for now is that I do target a 1% sell-through rate. Uh, I, I have right around a 1% sell-through rate right now. I found for my business, that's the healthiest like mix of profit and um, and actually moving the inventory, getting the cash flow back. There's definitely a, there's a, there's a perfect price that you want to list at. Basically, you don't want to sell so low that you're like making nothing on the item and you have, you're selling it immediately. You want to hold on to it for a certain amount of time. So you want to price in like a way where you're moving the inventory like a decent amount, but you don't want to like price it so low. Like you can, you can sell Super Smash Bros. Melee right now for like $45, like in five minutes and someone will buy it. But like it sells for 60 to 65 if you're willing to wait a little bit longer for that on eBay, I believe. Uh, so like waiting... waiting maybe like a few days or like a month or so for it to sell is much preferable to like kind of like trying to sell it like the next day, unless you just need to move it immediately, basically. All right, so I have two questions. On the IPI and the inventory Mm -hmm. limits, did the IPI make you a better seller? Um, well, I, it was a really messed up, situation i said before i think that made me a better seller because i didn't make me as greedy to try to like get every like penny uh from from my uh games basically uh i i think there's a there's a target that you should aim for with sell through you shouldn't keep it forever but you don't want to like let it go immediately so i i probably was holding on to my inventory too long i was trying to target too high of a price in that time period so i Uh, for me, I found that like one percent daily sell through is the uh, is the best, and I probably my mistake probably was back then like trying to like get like the maximum price for every game basically. So it's it was more you don't want to move it immediately for no money, but Right. you want to like make sure your inventory is still moving. Basically, you don't want to like hold on to like fifty copies of a game hoping that someone's going to hit it up. Basically, so there's like a There's a medium price you have to find uh, for that.
and you don't want to give it away, but you don't want to uh, like hold on for it forever, like waiting for the perfect price on that. Absolutely. And it's the same thing on eBay too. There's, there's a sweet spot where you can settle in, use the right keywords, price it accordingly, where you can get most of the money. You don't have to get all of the money and you don't have to give it away for free. And that was the podcast a couple of weeks ago with Isaiah, where Isaiah was selling a lot of shoes, but he was giving away good stuff for too cheap of a price in the sake of sell through where he even had a customer that messaged him back afterwards and said, hey, these shoes are great. I would have paid $15 more <laughs> for them. So, you know, we, we can kind of get into this point where we're shooting ourselves in the foot by giving money away. But we can also equally get to this point where we're shooting ourselves in the foot and it's priced so high that it doesn't sell. So the second question that I have on that is all of these changes, you know, I, I listen to all the Amazon calls, even though I, I don't sell on Amazon because a lot of it does translate. And I like listening to, I guess, the higher level of stuff that you guys talk about. Um, and when when we had uh, the guy on who we went to dinner at, he millions and millions of dollars. Every single time there's a change, his advice is always the same and it always kind of sticks out and catches for me. Do you do you know what what my biggest takeaway is when you guys discuss those things if you had to guess? Uh just I don't know, what do you think? You just have to survive it. Mhm. Mm because yeah. there'll be a lot of them that won't. Yeah, yeah. And then it'll be better on the other side. Yeah, that's what uh like the more obstacles Amazon puts up, uh, the more like some sellers feel like it's kind of making it harder for people and people will drop out of it. So if you can get over this one part of it, then like it's harder for the person coming after you. So like, even if you can figure it a way out a way to make it work uh, for you, uh, then it's going to discourage other people from like other people are going to drop out basically due to that. So like sometimes the changes like this can be good in that way. If you can find a way to adapt to it and find a way to change your business uh, with like that with that. So I agree with that. Definitely. Absolutely. And if you look at Amazon specifically, you know, back in the day, they let any Yahoo on there and sell. And then eventually mm -hmm. they said, OK, you need a pro sellers account. That's 40 bucks. That's an obstacle. OK, mm -hmm. you need um, you need an LLC. You need insurance. You need um you know to settle in with the ipi now these things are gated now you know now we're going to do this now this happens now it's 24 cents every single time you ship an item in all of these things are obstacles which they're not great mm -hmm. but if we can survive and adapt and pivot and overcome these things how many people have been eliminated from the pool of sellers where it starts just going like this and whoever can keep going for the, as long as possible, those yeah. are going to be the ones at the top getting the lion's share of all this, of all the sales because of all men, of all the obstacles and how difficult it was. And it's just not Amazon for eBay. You know, there, there's more sellers, the fees go up. Um, it's way more competitive with, with the thrifts, with sourcing, um, the keywords change all the time. All of these things are obstacles where if we can overcome them, the majority of the sales are up here at the top for the people that have been able to adapt and overcome them. So um, what are your thoughts on that? And I guess when you guys are having those discussions and that is the advice or that is the piece that or the conclusion that you guys have come to, because there's also been a couple of times, you know, once or twice where you know, maybe you sent me a message or you said on am or on the call where like, I don't know if this is viable anymore. <laughs> but uh, every single time you've said that you've overcome and your business has grown. Yeah, I think the kind of the low point for me was when I saw like over the summer when they cut my limits a lot and I saw like the, the prices of games tanking and uh, but like I got over that, like uh, I adjusted to it, like the market recovered as well. Um, that was like a couple of years ago when that happened. Uh, I'm just super grateful to have the opportunity to to do this kind of stuff. Like I can do it from home and make a really good income like doing it. So like I, I might seem like <laughs> to joke around a little bit about or be like scared of the changes, but like uh like I'm super lucky to actually be able to do this um, while I'm doing with this. And it's really cool to, you know, be involved in selling video games online, which is something like I really enjoy with it. Like I always enjoy like selling uh, 
like i i play a ton of video games like i was i was i was always interested in markets in video games so like i kind of learned how to like resell from playing video games doing auction houses and virtual economies that kind of stuff so to do it full time and like make a living off of that i'm like super lucky for that so i'm really grateful for the opportunity to do it and i just try to kind of uh keep uh evolving my business with the changes and trying to keep up with it and kind of be grateful for like being able to do this from home and make a really really good income from doing it as well so absolutely i 110 percent agree so all right so you you know you you keep your ear to everything that's going on with amazon a lot of stuff that's going on with reselling um when do you start i guess getting prepared for q4 and this might seem like a crazy question because it's only march but like this might not be a crazy question because for video games for Q4, like some people are preparing for that now. Yeah. So uh, you definitely could put aside uh, some games with it. Like Q4 comes like I've never been super prepared for it. I do try my best to like up my buying, but uh, there it's like crazy. Like you talked about Pie Face. Like I was involved in that kind of stuff years ago as well. I did some of the online arbitrage, the retail arbitrage. Uh, you like. A lot of people don't understand how fast some stuff sells. You could sell like 500 copies of Pie Face probably in an hour on Amazon right. basically during right. that time. So right. like <laughs> uh, it's it's hard to keep up with the demand like of that in Q4. There's so much demand on um, on uh, like in the these categories, uh, toys, video games, that kind of stuff. So I, I try to just like do my best for it. But each year, like I always like wish I'd done more, done better with it. <laughs> yeah. So like, even if you started to prepare now, you still won't be fully prepared. So I guess, I guess <laughs> take us through like a year of an Amazon video game seller. So are, are you setting aside games now that you know will pump and will increase in Q4? When do you start, I guess, ramping up the shipments? Um, when is the busy times? When is the low times? Because you mentioned that in the summer, the prices went down. Mm -hmm. So are are you still sending in the same velocity? Are you pricing down? Are you pricing up and waiting for Q3, Q3 and Q4? What has been your strategy historically, I guess, over the terms of 365 days? I guess start start in January. We, we just came off of Q4, December. How's January going? What is your philosophy? What is the velocity? Yeah, so uh, I've done this for a couple of years now, and it's been pretty, like, standard. Uh, the... Um the the waves and cycles uh january is usually super good um because people have gift cards people are buying stuff for consoles they got uh like over for christmas and the holidays and they've got uh there's also a lot of stuff that's out of stock that people haven't been able to catch up on from december like they got wiped out their inventory got wiped out so if you're a smaller seller you might be able to get stuff in quickly for that that basically really lasts until about april or so like i'm still having great sales right now in february um tax usually time, over, things yeah. like that tax return yeah yeah uh usually over the summers where it tapers off though and it kind of goes down to about october or so and then starts to pick up in november and december again uh it's still really good like i i did really good in previous years i think it just comes down to listing consistently and i really don't i i do add a few things in q4 i might send in some stuff like pie fight face board games during q4 like i buy some games uh from black friday deals and send those in q4 as well and mix that up a little bit but i'm just trying to stay consistent basically and there's always going to be demand for video games out there so if you're like as long as you're kind of listing like good quality stuff that people actually want to buy like you're going to do well pretty much year round on it I, I agree with that. All right. So a couple of things that have blown my mind during this conversation. You've held up about five Nintendo Wii games. Okay. <laughs> Nintendo Wii is almost 20 years old, Jack. Is Nintendo yeah. Wii popping off still 20 yeah. years later? Yeah, yeah. It's uh it did really well in 2020, uh, because people are using it to exercise with like Wii Fit, those types sure. of games. Um it's it still it still does well. There's like Wii is maybe one of the biggest things I sell. Uh, wow. Like Xbox 360, PS3, that that um, that's kind of the sweet spot for like the the stuff people are buying used uh, right now. Like people, uh, there's still a market for it actually uh, with that. And even the Wii consoles do pretty well. I know I have some friends who like refurbish them and send them into Amazon basically. So like there's definitely a market demand for it. Uh, you might not think it is but uh there's definitely a demand for like the older games like the physical like stuff as wow. well 
So there, there's definitely a demand because there's people doing millions and millions of dollars oh, yeah. with this stuff. So it, is it due to, I guess, the life cycle and the age where PS4, PS5, maybe people aren't getting rid of those yet, where they're still playing those things, I guess, first generation? Nintendo Switch, have they not given those up yet? And it's just not enough on the market it, where it, PS3, um, we and that kind of older generation is now available and better for the the second or third generation of the user yeah right now um as ps4 and xbox ones are getting a little bit older like i'm like adding them more into my inventory uh but okay. it's very hard to find uh newer stuff because uh there's you're competing with uh, the actual players and collectors and all that and uh, there isn't as much opportunity in that like with with gotcha. uh like someone gotcha. like someone might donate their old wii like stuff or want to just get rid of it they don't care about it anymore uh so let it go for a lower price where stuff like switch ps5 um like newer stuff is much harder to get like at a price that like you Makes can actually sense. be profitable with because you're competing with someone that actually wants the game to play yeah. still because they that makes mm -hmm. total sense that that does yep. make total sense all right so now the the question is I saw an article two or three weeks ago where Best Buy has eliminated all physical media from the shelves. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> are the days of disc-based, cartridge-based, are those over? And what happens to Jack 10, 15, 20 years from now when all the games are downloaded onto the system and there are no more physical media? Well, I, I enjoy playing downloaded games. Uh, I download most of my stuff. Uh, these days, I mostly play current stuff as well. Um, so I do enjoy downloaded games, um, but there's always going to be a collector market for this kind of stuff as well. Um, I I try to always keep up with uh, trends and demand and stuff. There's like, if tomorrow, like the video game market starts to tank, I probably would do something like cards or something else I enjoy as well. Um, I So... I'm not really that concerned about like the longevity of it. I think there's always going to be some demand for it. And I think that the consistent consistent consensus of the uh like resale community is like Best Buy removing physical is actually going to increase the value of uh DVDs uh because it's probably going to have more collectors like seeking them out and it's going to be harder to actually uh find them. So those actually will probably uh do a little bit better over time. Um and there might actually be a collectible market at some point for DVDs as well from like kind of like how uh, video game collectors uh, are collect to certain games. Maybe. I don't know. Like this love overproduction in DVDs. I don't know that market super well, but those are just kind of my thoughts on it. Sure. And, you know, guys our age, we have, you know, disposable income going out there buying the original NES that mm -hmm. came out in the, in the 80s. And here we are 40 something years later and people are still buying that like no one's it, it It arguably may never have been hotter than it is right now with the amount of people going back and buying it. And for my son, he grew up playing the Wii. He, he's mm -hmm. 20. So when he's 35, 40 years old, he'll have expendable income and he'll go back out and he'll go buy the Wii and he'll go buy the games from his childhood. So, you know, and then we can go on to PS4, PS5. So. We still have time, I guess. Not now that you put it that way, we still have time. I will say, when my son goes out and gets a game, I have him go out and buy that physical copy so he can go out and resell it, not download it to the machine, Jack. I used to do that years ago. Um, uh, I would like to, I would get games uh, when they came out and then resell them on my Amazon account. Uh, like I'd beat them in like a week and resell them and basically pay like five or six bucks for the game. Uh, right. But these days I, I do prefer the, uh, like I, as a video game seller, it might be uh, bad to say, but I do prefer the convenience of uh, digital as well. So like, whatever, <laughs> like I, I supply the market, like there's a market demand for it. I'm yeah. going to supply okay. it. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so do as I say, not as I do keep buying games. I'm going to keep yes. downloading. I, I, I like the collector aspect of it. I think it's really cool that people have collections and yeah. uh, buy up this stuff. So I think that's a great like thing to do if you're into that, like the collection aspect of it too, like uh, just owning that kind of stuff. Let me ask you this. If you have a PS3, a Wii, a Switch, and it has 50 games downloaded on it, is that Switch more valuable? Or do people no. just reset it and sell it? Uh, it's not. It's basically no value added to it if it has wow. games on it because those games are usually locked to, um, uh, especially with um, the Switch isn't, the ds and switches are a little bit different but if you especially like playstation and xbox if you want to uh 
play them on your account under your account name, you have to, you won't be able to play it. So there's basically no value in the digital games. There's no resale value in them. Yeah. So is so. it just strictly, it's easier to download it. That's why I yeah. do it. Yeah, it's easier to download. Also, uh, over time, they have sales on them as well. So, like, you might be able to get a game for like five to 10 bucks. So it was originally 60. So, I understand. Although it does break my heart. Yeah. I, I get it. it as a reseller, it, yeah, yeah. As a reseller, it hurts, but there's no value in digital games. Gotcha. All <laughs> right. So, I guess to wrap it up, what is Jack's plan going forward? Where are you at in the plan? I know you wrestle over from time to time. Do I want to leave the house, get a couple employees, get a warehouse, yeah. blow this thing up? Or do I want to stay home? Where are you at today, Jack? I really like my lifestyle of uh, staying home, like doing well with it, like having inventory delivered to me. So I think I'm going to keep that up uh, nice. with it, like stay or small with it. Um, I might change at some point. I'm probably going to add in some eBay uh, very soon. Like I'm going to start listing uh, stuff on there. Like I just have a, I'm passionate about cards. I enjoy it. It's just something I enjoy to do. Like I enjoy reselling them and selling them as well. Uh, it's something I haven't done in a long time. I like sports cards, uh, a little bit TCGs, that kind of stuff as well. Uh, so it's just like a hobby of mine that I enjoy doing. So I'd like to add that in as well, some card stuff. Uh, and I'll probably start doing some more uh, content on Instagram and YouTube at some point as well. It's kind of like scaling with that, like uh, nice. just uh, doing some like, generic like advice videos and uh talking about ebay sales and sales in general right. and something that we didn't touch a lot on was that you're pretty good at speculating too and a couple of weeks ago <laughs> a couple of weeks ago you you blew my mind where um you bought a box of cards it was for a uh, formula one yeah yeah so go ahead <laughs> that was so i i've had wins and i've had losses in this this was a big win i bought and uh, I enjoy cards. I enjoy speculating, uh, buying sealed product and stuff. I bought 10 of them during about 2021 or so or 2020 um, for about $700 a box. I bought 10 of them and they're Formula One cards from Tops. Uh, anyone in the card collecting world will know that like they've kind of exploded in value. Um, I still have, I think, four left, but I've rolled them out over time and I've uh, been selling them for about $3,000 each. Uh, I need to list another one soon. It's like... Uh, but that's the big win. I've had losses as well with it. I enjoy, I enjoy collecting and like holding like sealed stuff for fun. Uh, like it's cool to me. But like I've certainly had some losses, and that was the the biggest win that I've had in it though. And what what did you buy that box of cards for? Uh, I bought uh, ten of them for seven hundred, uh, so seven thousand total, and been selling for three thousand. Uh, so that'd be like thirty thousand uh, for that. But like that's not like this is kind of like investing <laughs> in crypto or stocks. <laughs> right. Like it's very speculative. Like right. this isn't something that right. you can't know. Like one of the problems with like investing in like there's video games. I've done this with as well. I've like graded video games, sold high end video games as well. The problem with doing the alternative asset like investing is that you have to resell it to get that money back. So you have to pay the fees. So right. they have to go up in value as well. So it's not something I recommend other people. It's something like I enjoy cards. It's fun to me. So I kind of do this as a hobby. Right. And this could have easily went the other direction. You yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Spend 700 and they could be worth zero, but yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the most powerful things when we all went out to dinner was that, you know, we were talking, we were talking and, you know, I said, hey, what do you do with all this stuff like you don't list on Amazon because it's like complete in box or it's sealed and things like that? Like you have a whole basement full. And the answer was, it doesn't matter. It's going to go up in value anyways. And yeah, <laughs> with clothing, that's not the case. With yeah. video games, you could sit all your video games downstairs and odds are if you revisit those things in 10 years, they're going to be worth more than what they're worth today. Yeah, you should check out my garage and my uh, storage. But like, I what like I don't recommend it as a good reseller. You should be like listing the inventory, turning it over. Um, it will go up in value most likely because it does get more rare over time. But to be the most efficient with it, you need to be listing. You need to be doing it. So don't do it. But it's not turned out pretty well for me. <laughs> well, the, the the question was because on Amazon you have to send in what the catalog says. So for mm -hmm. your complete in box and stuff like that maybe the listing isn't always there. So yeah. the complete in box or the sealed, we put it away, we put it to the side. And those are the items, sealed, complete in box, 
those are the items you could forget about for 10 years and you walk downstairs and you have a whole 401k uh, looking I, at you in the face. I uh man uh, I got plenty of stories from that and that's probably what I'm gonna have to list on eBay is that kind of stuff like mm -hmm. I have so much stuff that um like just because like it was maybe an Amazon return to me and now it's gone up in value from like right? just because it's no longer available like someone returned it to me it was twenty dollars at the time and now that's like five hundred dollars because no one can find it anymore there's a Barbie uh Barbie that I just never got around to listing that's like selling on eBay for now like eight hundred dollars now <laughs> wow. I just never got <laughs> and then and then I remember you showed that you had like some Zelda edition Nintendo 3DSs where like oh yeah <laughs> here they are now they're worth a thousand dollars or two thousand yeah, dollars here they are this is yeah. not the best practice but it is one of the upsides of being a video game seller is that generally the stuff does tend to go up in value over time if you don't list it <laughs> <laughs> absolutely all right so last question a fun one when you buy the collections has there ever been kind of a knock your socks off surprise did you ever buy a collection and you thought hey i'm gonna make a hundred bucks off of this and then there's a copy of sealed earthbound that was included or a copy of little samson as a bonus have you ever kind of i will i was the i think the best usually usually i do better uh than i expect um which is good uh, sometimes I'll find something crazy. The best I think I've done is um, during the height of the graded video game boom. And there was a lot of speculation graded video games. I'm I'm kind of like uh, on the fence about it. I think there's some advantages to it and some not. But I basically take it like I if there's advantage to the marketing grading, I'll, I'll grade it. But basically in a lot, there was like a sealed Halo, uh, original Halo. And it was a rare like variant of it. And I sent in that for grading. And I basically probably paid, you know, like 80 bucks for the lot or something. It was just one of the random games and it was just sealed. And I ended up selling that for about 3,500 or so, just um, nice. like after grading it. And it was just a rare kind of early print version of uh, Halo, basically. So nice. that's Good one of the one. better ones I can remember. <laughs> Good bonus right there. All right, Mr. Jack, I appreciate you jumping on with us this week. Um, where can the people find you on Instagram sure. or anywhere else? You are? I'm going to say right uh, now, you are the king of getting the best names on every single platform. <laughs> sure. My Instagram is video game sourcing. My YouTube is video game sourcing. Uh, I'm in uh, your group. Um, so you can find me there. I do the Amazon call uh, in video game call on Friday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, so if you join the group, you can jump on that call. And we basically just talk uh, random like Amazon video game stuff, like kind of like this conversation tonight. So if you want to like talk to me, uh, join the group. Uh, or follow me on Instagram. And I uh, have a YouTube channel that I'll be posting some videos too soon as well. Nice. And Jack's a friendly guy. He'll answer any questions. Jack will never turn you down, never say no. So if you got a quick <laughs> video game question, this guy has a tremendous amount of expertise. He has a tremendous amount of my respect. I appreciate everything that Jack does. He's a great guy, a great person. And, you know, I just want to say thank you for jumping on with us today. And Thank you for all the stuff that you, you've always done for me, and I appreciate everything that, that you do for everybody, Jack. So thank you very much for sharing your expertise, and hopefully we have inspired somebody somewhere to take some initiative, be actionable, because in the year 2024, you can make a lot of money just sitting at your house if you do it the right way. You don't even have to leave, right, Jack? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, guys. Appreciate it.